talk about a poem here today, yes, Cohen. Sir John. My name's Cohen. And my name's John. And we're here to talk about a song in the front yard by Gwendolyn Brooks. So let's we'll start with Gwendolyn Brooks herself. Born June 7th, 1917, in Topeka, Kansas, dying December 3rd. 2000, south side of Chicago, Illinois, really close to us. Well, Gwendolyn Brooks actually wrote this poem in 1963, and she was the author of more than 20 books. That's really cool. She was highly regarded during her lifetime. She was the first black poet to win the Pulitzer Prize. That's a really big accomplishment. That was the highest prize a woman could get, right? Yep. Yeah, and I was also I also heard that she was the first black woman to hold the role of consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. So in this poem, who do you think she wrote this for? Like, who do you think is the audience? The main person in this poem was the little girl who was sheltered by her mom. And I feel like she was kind of using the little girl to represent a lot of people. Maybe her personal life, feeling sheltered. Yeah, I feel like in real life, many people are pushed away from different kinds of people because of how people tell them, oh, no, that's not a good person. I think that's who she was really trying to aim for, reach out to in this poem. Yeah. So in this poem, she kind of compared the front yard to the backyard, talking about how the front yard was like the um, light area where everything's perfect, happy, and then the backyard's the dark area mentions in line three it says where it's rough and untended and hungry weed grows that kind of gives it a eerie feeling oh it's like the dark side but to her it's the light side she feels like that's where she belongs yeah and that's how people are really portrayed in reality because if you see someone like on the side of the street you're in, you're like oh can we give them money but your mom goes no right. they're just begging um Speaking of the audience, who are who is speaking to the audience? Who is the speaker of the poem? A, li who, a little, little girl. girl. The speaker of the poem is a little girl who is somewhat sheltered by her mom and can't play in the back alley with kids, even though she thinks that it would be a tremendous fun. Right. She talks about how they do some wonderful things on lines 9 and 10 and have some wonderful fun. Yeah. So throughout the poem... Her mom really just tries to push her away, but in this, she goes, I want to go into the backyard now. She, it really shows her lust to go into the backyard, how she how she earns to go into the backyard. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and the poem also talks about, in the third stanza, her mother, and how that Johnny May will grow up to be a bad woman, and George will be taken to jail, because he sold their back gate, but even through all this, she still wants to go to the backyard, back alley. And... Yeah, she's trying to see the bright in it because she knows that they don't have rules. They're not restricted. She knows that she would love it if she was able to go into the backyard. The plot kind of leads to the theme. So I feel like a theme for this poem would be a life is better if you take risks and don't let people control what you do. Do you have? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I feel like that's a good thing. That's what I came up with, too. In line 10, she goes, they do some wonderful fun. She knows that they have fun, but her mom is still keeping her back. And the theme is, if you, life is better if you take risks. So if she knows that they're bad and she risks going there, She'll be able to have fun. Right. And she knows it because she also says in line 12 how they don't have to go into quarter till nine. And I think that they don't have rules in how they can have fun till it goes dark outside. But her mom is keeping her back from this tremendous joy that she wants to experience. Speaking of tremendous joy, what figurative language did you find in this? Ooh, some joyful figurative language. I found a hyperbole in this text. I've seen the front yard all my life. So she's exaggerating. That's what hyperbole is. About how she feels that, it, that her mom's kept her in the front yard and she hasn't been able to experience everything. I think that this shows how much she wants to go 
Um, did you find anything? Yeah, I found some pers- personification in line three where it says, where it's rough and untended and hungry weed grows. Hungry weed, like, weed can't be hungry. So what do you think that adds to the poem? Well, I feel like that kind of describes it more. Like, if they just said, and weed grows, that doesn't describe the weed as well as saying hungry weed. Yeah, I think it really shows how kind of dilapidated it is back there and how bad it is. But I think it it really shows how desperate she is to get out and try to explore, which I think that this is about. Yeah. So have you found any other figurative language? Well, yeah, there were a couple more I found. On line 20, it shows some imagery saying how she struts down the street with paint on her face. Like, it helps you to imagine the paint on her face, making you more in-depth and able to relate with the story. One other thing I found, I know I have a lot here. I actually did some research and found there was something called the anaphora in stanza four, the very last stanza. I want to know what an anaphora is. Yeah, that's what I thought too when I saw it. So an anaphora is the repetition of the same word over and over at the beginning of each line. And in 18, 19, and 20, it all starts with Anne. It goes, Anne, I'd like to be a bad woman, too, and wear the brave stockings of night black lace and strut down the streets with paint on my face. Isn't that kind of a sound device? Yeah, kind of. But it's also kind of figurative language, because that's what Google said. While we're talking about figurative language and sound devices, I'll tell you a sound device that I found. So it starts to rhyme in the third stanza of our poem. Fun, my mother steers, but I say it's fine. How they don't have to go into quarter of nine. That's kind of those two lines show rhyming. And I think that it's supposed to show that it increases the reading because it flows better and makes you hear the powerful voice of the little girl. So did you find any sound devices, Cohen? Yeah, like most poems, it had the rhymes, like you said. And there was also line 11. It says, my mother sneers. Sneers is sound. The figurative language leads to structure. So let's talk about the structure. Yeah. So right. some. So just to lay the basis, this is a four stanza poem. And I kind of found it, it was rhyming and it was kind of free verse. Yeah. But more More reverse, yeah. Yes, that's what I thought too. I also noticed um, the first two stanzas start out with four lines, and then the third stanza has nine lines all of a sudden, and then the fourth stanza is back to four lines. Why do you think the author did that? So I think it's because in these, the first two stanzas in the last stanza, it's the girl talking, but. In this third stanza where it gets longer, it's the mom talking. And the mom mm-hmm. has more power, so she gets more lines in this. Because she gets more say, she gets more control. Yeah, well, so I think that's why they put it longer. I like that idea. I like it. Yeah, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Why, why do you think they said that he stole the back gate? Why'd they put that in parentheses? Um, I think it's because... She doesn't want that part to be a main part. She's just giving an example. Like a side note, kind of? Yeah, kind of like a side note. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really understand why she did that, so that's interesting yeah. as well. So our tone's getting a little shorter, gone. I mean, tired. yeah, we're getting kind of tired because we're reaching the end of this. But before we go, let's talk about the tone of the story. Tone, not mood. So... In this story, I found brave. So I think that this girl's really brave in what she does because she wants to go back there where her mom doesn't think it's safe. Did you find a tone? Yeah, I agree with that one. I see where you got that from. I feel like longing and curiosity was kind of the tone because she wants to know the feeling of the backyard and what it's like to live a bad life after seeing the charity children and how they are. Well, I shall not agree with that. So I really do think it's brave. I think that's what she is throughout the story. I think that's the tone of it. Be brave, be experienced, be adventurous, not what you said. How is she brave? How does wanting to go to the backyard make her seem brave? Because it's what her mom says is wrong. It's what she's been put up. It's what those kids are bad. They don't go to bed on time. 
I guess they are in the back alley where, where things are overgrown. So she's going to be brave and she's going to put herself in that situation. And I think that's bravery. I think that's what it, this poem is supposed to talk about. I don't know how that relates to you. I see, but the longing and curiosity, the whole poem, mm -hmm. she's talking about how she wants a peek at the back and um, she wants to go there now and down in the alley. She wants a good time. They do wonderful things. And she says it's fine and she'd like to be a bad woman. And she talks the whole time about longing for it and curious about it. Maybe just to wrap things up here, I don't agree with you. Just like the mom. And you're not agreeing with me, just like the daughter. Maybe we can find real life in this poem.